You're here, I'm here rather, you're here to listen, but I'm here to talk to you about um, an economic, give you an economic outlook. That's it's going to be my opinion, my view. But my view and my opinion is not something I sat down last night and worked out. My view and my opinion is something I developed over the years. It's stuff I lecture at university about. And it really is based on data, and the data is based, uh, data only comes from one place. I don't create the data. It's either going to come from the Australian Bureau of Statistics or the RBA, one of those two places. But generally speaking, it comes from the Australian Bureau of Statistics. I tend to interpret the data that um, I think comes from the most influ influential place. So in that context, and some of you might have a different view than me, but in that context, the Australian economy is run by two parts. I mean, apart from all the stuff that we do in, the, in a micro sense and how we build up into gross domestic product, and that's a, that's a measurement of what we do, at a top level, it's got run by fiscal policy or monetary policy. Fiscal policy is government policy, monetary policy is the Reserve Bank of Australia. Fiscal policy, Generally speaking, the sorts of things I'm talking about here are, you know, uh, you know, allowances for kids, families when to have a baby, or you know, building up infrastructure, which is what Abbott's talking about at the moment. He's trying to get the states to do things, um, or it's about lowering taxes, increasing taxes, making a decision to look after airports, hospitals, those sorts of things. But fiscal, uh, fiscal um, policy in Australia right now is sort of pretty much dead to flat. And the main reason for that is because fiscal policy, new fiscal policy, increased fiscal policy requires increase in expenditure. Increased expenditure means either they raise more taxes or they borrow money. They're not going to do either, and they can't do either. They're not going to borrow more, um, get more taxes because we're not going to earn more, and they're not going to borrow money because they've got a deficit to look after, and as a result of having a deficit to look after, they're trying to take the surplus, so fiscal policy dead. So the only other area you're going to find good policy is in the RBA. Now, the RBA's policy is around interest rates. Now, whether or not you agree with what the RBA has done or not, is, in my view, is completely irrelevant. The point is, if you're a property investor or you're a person who owns property or you're advising people who own property or you're involved in property generally or any asset class for that matter, you need to know what's going to happen with interest rates. You need to know what's going to happen with interest rates because interest rates influence the way property prices fluctuate. They, the interest rates create or influence aggregate demand and aggregate supply. And where aggregate demand curve meets the aggregate supply curve, you go across to the axis and that gives you price. So if one moves out and one moves in, you ch prices can go up or down depending on the, which, the, on the directions they're moving. So you've got to understand what, interest, what determines interest rates. As I said, I don't care whether you do or you don't like the RBA's decisions, but the artist, RBA is the arbitrator of interest rates in this country. So we need to know, you need to know, I need to know what the RBA is thinking, rightly or wrongly. Because the name, of property, the name of investing in any asset class, including property, is knowing when to buy, when to hold, and when to sell. Buy, hold, or sell. And buy, hold, and sell in which region? So is it, is it time to buy, hold, and buy in the Gold Coast and sell in Brisbane? Or is it time to sell in Sydney and buy in the Gold Coast? Or is it time to hold and do nothing? So the RBA is the arbiter in this environment, not us. We have no influence over whatsoever. And affordability is the most sensitive component to house prices. After that comes supply and demand, or demand and supply. But affordability first and foremost. And the RBA doesn't determine supply, but indirectly they can influence supply. The RBA does determine affordability. So let's have a look at it. So you'll read a lot of stuff. I mean, I write for the newspapers every week. I do 19 publications a week. And I am one of those journalists Let's call it sort of journalist about commas. I'm one of those journalists. I'm always looking to think. I'm always thinking about. Gee, what am I going to write about this week? I'm desperate for a story. And over a six-month period, I just basically do the same stories, and I just keep regurgitating and upgrading them, which is what journalists do. And I'm always looking for an edge. There's nothing new in what I write. Nothing new in what any journalist writes. It's the same crap every year, year after year after year. And I know in January I've got to start talking about fixed rates, and I know in June I've got to start talking about fixed rates. I know when every time the RBA is going to make an announcement, I'm talking about whether they're going to put rates up or down. And then when they do make the announcement, I'm talking about why they put rates up and down, etc. And then some, some information comes out, some data comes out, you know, it's about the Aussie dollar, etc. I'll talk about the Aussie dollar. What I, don't think, what I think is not helpful in what I do and what other journalists do is that it's actually, we, com we compartmentalise various factors that affect interest rates in this country and property prices in our stories. And as a result of that, we, all of us, 
take our eye off the overall view. We take our eye off the ball and we start to focus on that one component. Each of the components has a different weight in the sum of deciding what happens with interest rates because there are a number of components. So what I'm going to do today is talk to you about what I consider to be the 10 most important components of what happens in this country that ultimately affect interest rates, that ultimately influence house prices and supply and demand. I would rather say it again. I would like to talk to you about it today, but the 10 most important things that ultimately determine, ultimately determine interest rates, which ultimately determine, let's call it affordability, which ultimately determine prices. I left out affordability in the first way I explained it to you. So that's my sequence, the 10 most important things. Now what I'm saying to you here is, read what you bloody like. I mean, there's so many things to read. There's so many publications now. There's the internet as well. There's online stuff with Fairfax. There's News Limited Online. There's newspapers you pick up every day. Fin Review. As I said, I write in those papers. I know all the kids, all the young kids, I'm the oldest bloke there, all these kids, I know what they're doing. They're, looking, they're desperate. They come and talk to me and say, what, are we, what, are we going to write about? what about if I write about this? You know, what do you think? It's the same stuff year after year. So it's important to know when you're reading this stuff where it fits. So let's have a look at them. My view. It's my view, right? It's not anyone else's view. You might think there should be 12 things or 20 things. 10 things, all I reckon is all, all that matters. 10 things, by the way, is enough to remember. Okay. First thing. We hear about GDP, gross domestic product. What does it mean? It doesn't mean anything. It's a mathematical formula, comes up with a sum, a number, a conclusion. And basically what it is, it's a method, mathematical method of doing, a, 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 a summarising what the economy has done in a, from a quarter to a quarter, from a half to a half, or a year on year. So for a whole year, this government like all governments, want to measure how the economy has gone. And they do it, one of the methodologies is this thing called gross domestic product. It sort of measures our productivity. Now, it's not an exact science, but it's a mathematical formula, but it's simply a formula, though. Some genius worked it out, but it's a mathematical formula. It's quite simple, which is the genius, you know, that's the, one of the outcomes of a genius, or one of the traits of genius, they come up with something quite simple. It doesn't measure the standard of living. It's not a proxy for how well the country is going. It is a proxy for productivity. But really, most importantly, it's a pro proxy for how we went in one period compared to this period. So what it likes to do is grab the gross domestic product sum from, say, 2013 and compare it to where the gross domestic, gross domestic sum is in 2014. And it likes to see an increase. We use in Australia something called the expenditure method, and most of the countries do too. But there are a number of methods. This is one method which we adopt in this country. The US adopt the same method, and a number of other countries adopt the same method. And the objective is to compare us to other countries. So did Australia's gross domestic product grow from 2014 to March 2015? Did it grow? How much did it grow by? And how does that compare to America? How does that compare to the UK? That's the game that we're playing here. And international investors will look at that and say Australia is growing at so-and-so rate or China's growing at so-and-so rate, much double our rate, more than double our rate. Um, therefore, Australia is a good place to invest or a bad place to invest. And what it does, it attracts the flow of money. It attracts liquidity. Now, we need, in this country, liquidity. Because if we don't have liquidity, we're going backwards. What attracts liquidity is growth. What governments get measured on is growth. If you have two negative quarters of that number, technically you're, you're said to have a recession. A recession is just a word that surrounds two quarters of negative growth. So if 1.4 trillion a year is our GDP number, our gross domestic product, according to that formula, and if we don't grow by, if we, the next year is 1.35 trillion, that means, or the next quarter, it's a quarter of whatever that is, say 400 million, 400 billion I should say, someone would say Australia's going backwards. And if you do that two quarters in a row, we've got a recession. As soon as we hear about a recession, sentiment changes. As soon as sentiment changes, people leave their hands in their pockets and they don't spend. The more they do it, the more recessions we have because less we grow. House prices start to come down. Pretty simple. 
And it's a pretty simple formula. It's so um, instinctive, it's ridiculous. It's the sum of household consumption, business investment, government investment or government expenditure, and the difference between exports minus and imports. In other words, do we export more than we import or do we import more than we export? That gives you a gross domestic product, gives you that 1.4 trillion number and what the government's trying to see, did we grow? Now, what's important about this is the Reserve Bank of Australia, in context, what's important about this, because whilst the government wants to grow, they're also trying to build a deficit, uh, a surplus, I should say, from the deficit. So they're not that worried about growth. They want growth, but they're not that worried about it. The Reserve Bank of Australia has a mandate. In its mandate, one of its, has three mandates, three parts to its mandate. Most important mandate, the last part, is to maintain the prosperity and welfare of all Australians. Now, it's in, their, it's in their legislation. It's in the Reserve Bank Act. That's what the governor of the Reserve Bank and his governors have to, uh, board members have to provide. That's what the, the 500 economists have to provide. That's their job, to make this country prosperous. Now, how do you measure prosperous? You look at growth. And what thing do they use for growth? They use that. And the growth number they want, what they call growth trend, is 3.5%. They want that number to grow 3.5% year on year. That's all they want. They don't want it to be a 6.5% because they get nervous. They don't want it to be a 2.5% because they're not doing well enough. They want 3.5%. So what do they do to influence that outcome? They play with interest rates. That's what they do. They play with interest rates. So trend growth on that number is 3.5%. You need to know. That's all you need to know. That number, year on year, what we're trying to see, is it going to grow 3.5%? Because if it's not, if it's growing too hard, which it's not at the moment, you're going to see interest rate rises. And of course, that affects affordability, and of course, that affects house prices. If it's growing below 35 you're not going to see rate rises. Irrespective of what all the journalists say and all the bloody commentators, they don't know. Reserve Bank's interested in one thing, prosperity and welfare. The welfare part comes in a little bit later in one of the other points I want to raise with, but that's on the unemployment part. But that's an important formula, and that's the first most important thing you need to know, the context of why that's important, because it affects the Reserve Bank's views on interest rates, what it's going to do. You look what the Reserve Bank says every month, every month on the first Tuesday every month, 2.30 p.m., 2.31 p.m. on the internet, rba.gov.au, whatever it is, you'll see they talk about growth in this country. Pretty easy for me, simple. Household, let's look at the various parts, because there's four parts to it, and they're, and they're or, yeah, four parts to it, or to the sum, five parts, f five components, but four parts. Household consumption, they're the items that make up how they measure household consumption. They add all those together. They're pretty normal sort of things, you, nothing outrageous that you wouldn't expect. Has food, what, what is the productivity, what is the amount of food that's being, money being spent on food? Alcoholic beverages and tobacco, sorts of things all of us enjoy every single day of the week and sort of things we need for, to run our homes and our households. That household consumption number is affected by a number of things. What drives household consumption is wages, wage, wage rises. So if you see something in the Fin Review and says that wage rises have been flat, or, or income, wages are flat and aren't increasing, that affects the amount of money that gets spent in here. Wages, if wages aren't going up, that affects that number. Now this number, household consumption, accounts for 60% of the GDP number. So it's the biggest component the most influential component, 60%. So wages affect that, confidence affects that. So when the National Bank puts out a surveys on confidence and the various confidence numbers come out, those things are important because it affects this. So if you keep getting no confidence, no wage rises, high unemployment, that number won't change. It could go backwards. That number goes backwards and it accounts for 60% of GDP, it's gonna be a bit of a struggle to get GDP growth at 3.5%, which means the Reserve Bank will keep interest rates where they are. Okay, you, are you following this? You getting the trend? Okay. Business investment. <clears throat> now, generally speaking, economists break business investment up into two parts, mining and non-mining. The main reason, that's sort of more of a new phenomenon, than, but it's sort of been more of a phenomenon in the last 
since the GFC period, because mining investment was probably the biggest component of the GDP number that propped up our GDP and didn't put us into a recession, in other words, like the rest of the world. We are growing in mining investment. And what we're talking about here is capital expenditure. I don't know how much a mining company pays in wages, but capital investment of a mining company. They build a new mine, they build all the roads and infrastructure that goes around the mine. So that big investment that the mining companies build to increase their capacity to take more stuff out of the ground. They increase their capacity to take more stuff out of the ground to meet the demand that is coming from China, India, Korea, Japan, etc., our Asian partners, the people who we export 75% of exports to, and I'll come to that as another important point. But that mining investment is very, very important. It's the amount of money that mines increase their capital expenditure. The word is increase. I'm not saying they've stopped capital expenditure, but are they increasing? Are they planning to increase their capacity beyond where they planned three or four years ago? They only do that when demand for their product increases. So when you hear about China is growing at 7%, and and, 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 which is a little lower than where it's been growing over the last few years, and is Chinese government's for economic policy is talking about maintaining 7%, that means China's our biggest export partner. 25% of our exports go to China. That means that we are doing less we're less likely to be increasing our exports to China, which means we are less likely to need more capacity because we've got a huge amount of resource here. We've got less likely to have more mining capacity to get all the resources out. Therefore, if we don't have more demand for our product and we have less need to build our capacity, it means the mining number will shrink. The not mining capital expenditure of the GDP number will shrink. That's where we are now. So when you read about that in the papers, Mining companies have topped out, they're not spending more money, they're spending the same money, not spending more money. That's because China and those places are flatlining in terms of their extra demand on terms of what we are delivering. It doesn't mean we, we are delivering less resources. They're just growing at a slower rate in their capacity, their ability to mine more. So that part of the component of a, uh, business investment is down. Non-mining investment is what everyone else spends. The rest of the, every other business, small business owners, medium-sized business, business, banks, whatever, IT expenditure, new premises expenditure, new business expenditure, capital stuff, capital, stuff where we borrow or we tap the share market or we spend our retained earnings, that sort of expenditure. The Reserve Bank's made it pretty clear. Their analysis, which gets done every six months, they, pr they print a report on the financial health of the economy, they're saying, there's a, from their surveys, there needs a lot more improvement is necessary before hiring or investment increases. So we're not going to get any upkick in the GDP number to get us at trend or above trend growth for GDP from either one of those two components. But, you know, the stuff you read, will fit, you'll be able to fit in to all this sort of stuff, all these components when you're reading. You'll be able to put it into context. So there's no point reading the stuff in the newspaper and not having a context. Otherwise, it just goes in and goes out. Government investment, look. Governments aren't going to invest any money. The government investment component of the GDP number is going to flat, be flat. When you, hear, when you hear hockey talk about going to the States, getting, encouraging the States to sell their assets off, and then there's going to be some sort of matching by the federal government, that's going to take years. So over the next two years, I don't expect to see any government investment over and above what they're currently doing. I'm talking about extra government investment. In fact, you might even see less government capital expenditure, government public servant employment. You're not going to see more. You're going to see less. So you're not going to get anything from that. But things aren't all that bad. Now, hang on, I'm going to the next one. Exports minus inputs. This is where we get fixed up. So the mining companies, what they did is build all this excess extra capacity during the mining boom, or what was it considered a mining boom. Probably a better way of putting it during the mining boom, the mining demand boom, the demand for mining product, the demand for our resources, that boom which happened, started in 2006, 7, 8, 9, has been going through. So our mining companies responded by building excess capacity, new capacity to take more of the resource on the ground, out of the ground, and get it to China and India and Korea and Taiwan and Japan. So, and by spending all this money, extra money, on new capacity during 7, 8, and 9, and 10, they actually helped us, stopped us from going into a recession because they kept our GDP number above growing. They just kept it growing. It wasn't growing brilliantly, but they kept it growing. They stopped that 
I've just went through why mining companies have stopped investing in new capital, but as a result of this excess capacity, they now can export more, because, and the demand is there. And because they're exporting more, irrespective of the Aussie dollar, because they're exporting more, our exports are bigger than our imports, which gives me a positive number between exports minus imports, which gives me a positive input component into the GDP number, which helps my GDP come in around 2.5% growth per annum. Below trend, trend's 3.5%. It's not less than zero, which is very good because that would be a recession. It's more than 1% because 1% is scary to capital markets. 2.5% is pretty good. Relative to the rest of the world is brilliant, other than the, the countries like China and those sorts of places, but relative to our, our competitive environment is brilliant. It's not a trend, bless you. It's not a trend because 2.5% is below 3.5%, which means interest rates aren't going to go up. They're going to stay where they are. I'm trying to make sense why the Reserve Bank's keeping rates where they are. So, you look at the components, GDP, we want 3.5% increase every year. We want it to trend that way every quarter. The Reserve Bank looks for the medium term. Medium term for the Reserve Bank is 12 to 18 months. Not one month, not two months, not six months, 12 to 18 months. They're looking and they're prepared to wait. They're patient. They're prepared to wait to see if they're going to get that 3.5% increase. You've, I've shown you the components. I just want to talk a little bit more on this export minus import piece because it's quite important. We have a lot of people talk to us about how important America is. I want to give you some context. America is very important to us. The money flow between us and the US in terms of trade is huge. The amount of money they invest here as well as the amount of money we ex things we export to there. But if you're looking at purely at pure economics of GDP, they are not the most important country. Japan is a larger market for export from this country than the United, U, a European Union and the US combined. So why do we need to worry about the European Union? If you're just looking at this, you don't need to worry about the European Union. They're a very small component of our GDP number, which drives whether or not the Reserve Bank's going to increase interest rates or not, which drives the affordability factor, which drives property prices or demand and supply for property. The countries you've got to worry about China, Japan, South Korea, and the other Asian countries. 75% of our exports go. Let me just explain in real simple terms for China. When China says we have changed our internal economic policy from one of dri uh, driving infrastructure to one of driving consumer growth, that's a really important thing. And what's important about that is this. When you're building infrastructure, you are building cities, and you're taking people, and the cities are being built in rural areas. Not only do you displace the rural people, but that's more an internal policy as opposed to a demographic policy as opposed to an economic policy. But when you're replacing them, you're replacing a number of other things. The first thing you're replacing is protein, because largely these rural environments, they produce protein. So there's no protein in the area where you're building the city now and you're building the roads and infrastructure. That's the first thing that gets replaced. Second thing, you have people coming to these cities, so they need protein. So who exports protein? We do. We're a big exporter of protein. Beef, lamb, etc. Wheat. That's the first thing that's very good for us when they have infrastructure growth. The second thing is very good for us when they have infrastructure growth is that to build the infrastructure, they need steel. Steel builds cities and roads and bridges, etc. Steel is a byproduct of iron ore. We export iron ore. That's very good for us when they have an infrastructure policy. The third thing you need to do, you need power to build a city and you need power to maintain the city. In the case of China, it's thermal power. We are a big resource for thermal coal. That's good for us when infrastructure policy is in existence in China and other places, by the way. I'm just using China as an example. So what happened? China's changed that policy for infrastructure policy. They're saying they're not going to do extra. They're going to keep building these cities, so we're going to keep delivering to them what we've delivered in those three categories. But they've now gone into consumer environment, consumer growth, consumer policy. They want Chinese people in China to spend more money in the cities that they live in. They want them to buy more stuff. Now, we're not a big exporter of consumer-related products. In fact, we don't do very much at all. We export education and things like that, but 
generally speaking, we don't, we don't manufacture much stuff that goes to China. So that doesn't help us. So therefore, don't expect too much more growth in the resource sector to the extent that we feed those three requirements, protein, iron ore and uh, coal, heating and power, with the new Chinese policy, economic policy for consumer-driven growth. So it's very important when you follow what the Chinese government's doing, when you read about what China's doing, it's very important to get your head around all that stuff. Where does that fit into us? I mean, all we're interested in is how does it affect me? We're all selfish. You've got to be selfish. Be very selfish when you read this stuff. Otherwise, you're just wasting your time. You're here, you'll spend your time to come here today. Be selfish. And I don't mean that in a sinister sense. I'm being, if you're going to absorb something, absorb something that has meaning and takes you to it somewhere. And that's the whole point of understanding what China's doing, how it affects GDP, because GDP affects growth. Growth in GDP affects, no growth in GDP affects whether or not we're going to have interest rate change. Bottom line. And that's interesting to see those growth markets. America's not even, it doesn't even figure. Now, where they do figure, I should say this just for context. I don't want to get into this, a different talk altogether. But um, liquidity does come from, to our country, to our banks and our balance sheets, which allows us to lend money. Does a lot of it, 40% of it, does come from the US and Europe in combination. So if there's no liquidity in those places, as a result of them doing really bad, um, then that, that does affect us, but it's not, too, it's not a big issue at the moment because both those countries are starting to, those areas are both starting to recover. Sixth most un, important thing you need to know is unemployment. Unemployment fits into the category of where, you, where the Reserve Bank has to look after prosperity and welfare. Now, welfare means what they basically want is all Australians to be employed. They want full employment. Full employment means around 5% unemployment, technically speaking. So they don't like to see that number to go from five to seven. They certainly don't want to go from five to ten. Countries get uh, assessed on their unemployment numbers. You know, the US is sub ten now, but it was a, a, a more than ten before, during the GFC. You know, we were some parts of Australia, not here, not in, not in Gold Coast and not in Queensland, but in parts of um, uh, Western Australia, well, Western Australia was sub five percent during the, during the GFC. We had 4.8% unemployment in those places. 5.7 in, say, export areas in Victoria. Here in Queensland, it was about 5.2, as I recall. So, but overall, it's, so we're talking about average numbers here. The Reserve Bank's only interested in national number. They don't care about any particular area. They're interested in the national number. National number is currently at six, trending higher. The Reserve Bank doesn't like that because that means in the terms of the welfare, looking after prosperity, that's, that's okay. It's not quite where they want it. And looking after the welfare of all Australians, big one is unemployment. 6% is not a number they like, and anything beyond 6% is something they definitely don't like. What influences unemployment? Uh, it, that is, the, the un, thing that influences unemployment is, or, or employment, or lack of employment, is the appetite of employers to spend more money. In other words, that comes down to their bottom line, their revenue number. And interest rates affect them, because interest rates affect their ability to get revenue if they're in the retail industry, or it affect, affects their ability to get um, customers over the bank. If interest rates are too high, they have, that, that affects them. That household consumption number affects all businesses, every business. And if interest rates are too high, it affects all of those people. So really important to understand that an unemployment is driven off the back of sentiment, interest rates, and the way people, fit, uh, the way people interact in that household consumption part of the formula. Unemployment otherwise is not important to you, other than as a number, and I mean that. Oh, you've got to be, as I said, oh, you've got to be selfish. You've also got to be, you've got to glaze over these things, not get into the emotion of the stuff. When 4,000 people lose their job at Toyota or wherever it is, a Ford plant, I mean, that, that's terrible for them as an, at an individual level. But if you're looking just simply, how's it going to affect me? As I said, you've got to be a bit selfish about it. Don't get caught up in that stuff. That's what newspapers do. We get caught up in it because we know we can, we can play around and manipulate your emotions. Because we want to sell newspapers to you. That's what we're doing. We're not actually trying to deliver good, valuable information for you to use selfishly to make a decision about your welfare. You remember that. Don't get caught up in that crap. Read it if you want on a Saturday morning, you have a cup of coffee and you hang out. But just be able to take a step back and say, okay, well, how does that affect me? That's how it affects you. 4,000 means not a lot when you have 600,000 turning over every month. Inflation. We keep hearing about inflation. Inflation is a formula. 
It takes those numbers in the household, those categories. There's 11 categories of inflation, main categories, 11 inflation. There's 90 subcategories, but there's 11 for all intents and purposes. It comes out every quarter. The inflation number gets printed on the 26th, 27th, 28th of the month following the end of the quarter. So 27th of July, following the June quarter, blah, blah, blah. Australian Bureau of Statistics prints it. They come out, they, they put in their 11 categories, but there's a lot of categories that sit behind them. They say, what was the calculated uh, uh, price of uh, clothing and shoes, footwear, as one category, the same categories I showed you on household consumption, has it gone up? If it's gone up, that gets added up, and they then put weighting against all the various categories, so some categories are more important than others, and they come out with a CPI number, a cons a consumer price index change, or an inflation number. That's just a number. Australian Bureau of Statistics prints a number. Where it's important is what does the Reserve Bank think about that number? What does the Reserve Bank want? Well, the Reserve Bank wants that inflation number to go between 2 and 3% annualised. They don't want it to grow more than 3%. They don't want it to grow less than 2%. They want it in the middle of 2, 2, 2, 2 to 3%. Why? Well, in 1996, the Reserve Bank sat down when they looked at their mandate and they said, how are we going to deliver on our mandate of looking after unemployment in this country, looking after the currency, and looking after the prosperity and welfare of all Australians? Well, they decided in 1996 that they would try and maintain an inflation rate of between 2 and 3%. 1996, we're still looking at that 2 and 3%. It may be the right number, maybe the wrong number, but it doesn't matter. That's what that it is. You and I are not going to change it. That's their view. 2 to 3%. That's where they want it. If it starts going above 3%, they crank the interest rates. If it goes below 2%, they reduce the interest rates. They do it over a a 12-month period. So if inflation number comes out for this quarter at 3%, that doesn't bother them. They're interested in this developing into a trend. They're interested in tw trends, 12 to 18-month trends. Now, the Reserve Bank's been very clear in their latest paper. And what they said in the latest paper is this. Currently, uh, inflation between, is right in the middle between 2 and 3%. It's 2.5%. Perfect from their point of view. They have said, as a result of the Aussie dollar going down, now, they did predict it was going to go down to 82, 83. It's at 90-something, so this may not be as big a problem as they originally conceived. But as a result of it being in that area, and as a result of a number of other aberrations, they expect inflation to hit 3% in the, the end of June quarter. So they're expecting in July the 26th, when the Australian Bureau of Statistics prints a number on inflation, that it'll come out at around 3% annualised. But they said, we're not worried about that. They, the Reserve Bank, have all went on to say, we expect, we, the Reserve Bank, expect that to come back to 2.5% by the end of this calendar year. 2.5% is perfect. So what that means in the Reserve Bank's mind, unless something major changes in the Reserve Bank's mind, that means they don't need to reduce, uh, increase interest rates or reduce interest rates. They don't need to do anything. They'll stay the same. Which means affordability will stay the same in the medium term, which means house prices should stay the same in the medium term or go up, depending on where the, the um, population growth demand comes from, or how, how well that builds. So, inflation is only important from the point of view of why the Reserve Bank, what the Reserve Bank wants it to be, and why they want it to be there. So inflation, that's the seventh most important thing you need to know about. So when you're reading about it, you think, oh, they said something about inflation, what does that mean to me in terms of affordability, house prices, property prices, flow of ch change in property prices, Supply and demand, it means what the, it, it, it only has an importance in terms of what effect it's going to have on interest rates. Australian dollar, keep hearing about that all the time. Australian dollar is not that important to any one of us, unless you're a trade exporter or an importer or you're a trader in the dollar and trading currencies or some of that, which some of you may be for that matter, but generally speaking, we keep hearing about it. It's important to the Reserve Bank. But the Australian dollar has an effect on export industries it has, and therefore can have an effect on employment or unemployment, can create unemployment. Australian dollar can have an effect on the price of goods, can have an effect on the difference between export and import prices. In other words, if we're exporting a whole lot of stuff and we're getting a lot less for it, that's a problem. But that's the only sort of real categories, I see the Australian dollar, the currency, a little bit out wide in terms of importance to us when it comes to property prices. That's the eighth most, most important thing I think you need to know. Ninth one, ultimately interest rates. 
Interest rates, Reserve Bank said this, not me, is the single most important factor in the affordability, in the affordability um, algorithm for property prices, obviously. Now, when it comes to doing, you know, I'm a lender, when it comes to deciding how much we're going to lend somebody, I'll tell you what we do. We look at your ability to service a debt. That's called a debt servicing ratio. A net servicing ratio is all sorts of formulas, but we use what they call an NSR. And in making that assessment of your ability to service a debt, what we do is we take the prevailing interest rate. Now, our interest rate is set off effectively what the Reserve Bank what the Reserve Bank rate is. Now, that's the lowest rate in the market. The Reserve Bank rate, the cash rate, is the lowest rate in the market for the lowest risk environment. None of us can invest at that rate because that's, we can't invest with the Reserve Bank. The Reserve Bank won't take our money. We only just look after the Australian government. But that's the, that, that rate there sets off every other interest rate in the market. So if I'm lending to you at 5.5% and the Reserve Bank rate's 2.5%, that 3% premium is the premium for risk I must charge you over and above the relative risk that the Reserve Bank would charge, some, uh, I would charge the Reserve Bank or if I was depositing with the Reserve Bank. That's, that's the relativity. It's a relativity argument, and that's sort of where it sits. Now, what's important to understand, 2.5% to 5.5% is sort of right around about the money when it comes to standard variable rate. I'm not, not discounted rate, but standard variable rate. It's 300 basis points. That is, that spread is quite important. That spread is the high, highest it's been since 2008, or 2007. In other words, the risk assessment between the Reserve Bank number and what retail number is, is the highest it's ever been, which is the reason why banks are making more money than they ever made before. And the reason why that is so high is because they can. They went and bought everything. And during the GFC, that's the reason why the banks make more profit than ever before, even though their books are growing at a slower rate than they've ever grown in the last 15 years. Average long-term growth in mortgage build, or the amount of mortgages you, you put out there into the system, since 1945, is on average 8% per annum. Some use 12, some use 6, but on average. Currently, it's sub-5%. It has been sub-5% for the last four years. But all of a sudden, the banks are making record profits, bigger profits than they've ever made before. And they're making it out of the spread. The difference between the cash rate and what they retail at. And that comes off their back, what they call their back book. So it's important for you to understand, if you're looking at prop buying property, how do I get the best rate in the marketplace? Because, you know, 50 basis points can mean $100 a month on a $350,000 loan. And over 30 years, that's a hell of a lot of money. It's $30,000. So you work it out, and if you understand how compounding works, that's very important. So what's important for you to find out where is the cheapest rate in the marketplace? You and or your people you're mentoring, and or yourself, if you're investing. So interest rates becomes extraordinarily important. Not only should you be getting the lowest rate in the market, you've got to understand how interest rates move. Should I be fixing? Should I be part variable, part fixed? Not only that, if you're mentoring somebody, you've got to know how to talk to them about interest rates. Because the first thing someone says, well, should I be buying because their interest rates are low or should I be buying because interest rates are high when they get better? I mean, like, which one? Well, you should buy. It doesn't matter when you buy. You buy for the right reasons. You buy because you can afford it and you buy because the fundamentals, it's the right price. And there's upside. And you're building a portfolio. And it's a long-term view. But you also need to be able to talk comfortably to your people, your mentoring, your customer, your client, your friend, yourself, your family, your colleagues, sensibly about interest rates. You need to be able to take people through the 10 steps or nine steps and arrive here. Today, we have historical low interest rates. Simple most important factor is it's a factor. Interest rates are just one factor, but it's affected by eight things that go before it. They're the eight things that go before it. Now, I'm not making this stuff up. If you look at the Reserve Bank's one page they put out at 2.30 p.m. on the first Tuesday of every month, except for the month of January, they go through those eight things. It's nearly like they roan out or they uh, just take it out, uh, paste in the current month information into the particular paragraph. The paragraphs don't even change. The language only changes during rate rise periods or when there's a change in the cycle. But they hit the same things every time. They hit global developments around the world, they hit resource prices, they hit trade numbers, they hit inflation, they hit unemployment, they hit um, 
uh, mining, non-mining investment. They had all those, get the con household consumption, et cetera, et cetera. And they end up at affordability. They talk about demand. They, they hit all those points. I extracted out of the eight things that I think are the most important things. Every single month is the same stuff. You know, they all sit around, they get a, get a report from this 500 economists in the Reserve Bank, and what they do is they build, the, the bureaucracy builds a recommendation to the Reserve Bank Board. The Reserve Bank Board then sits down, they have a, you know, a cup of tea and a donut or a lamington, and they hold hands and sing Kumbaya. <laughs> on a Tuesday, they sit there for a few hours, and they opine on what they should do and shouldn't do, or stay the way they are. The statement's already made for them, they'll agree on the statement, they have a vote, and agree on it or disagree, whatever the case may be, then they put it out on the system. But they hit the same eight points I just went through with you to arrive at that number. And that, I'm not saying interest rates are the most important, the Reserve Bank's saying that. It doesn't matter if they're right or wrong, I don't care. That is what it is, and that's what you've got to work with. None of us are going to change their mind. I just want to talk about the quality of Australian mortgage market. I had an argument with uh, Harry Dent a little while ago, last month. I had a debate with him, actually. I had one in Sydney, one in Melbourne, uh, one in Brisbane. And I like to say I thrashed him. <laughs> he reckons Australian property price is going to fall by 50%. This is him again, Harry. I did, got him three years ago. We actually went up 30%. He reckoned they were going to go down by 50% three years ago, and he's still saying that. I said, listen, Harry, in front of everybody, I said... If I know one thing is for sure, you will be right one day, because if you keep saying that every year, year after year after year, eventually it will happen. But guess what? Whilst it's going up, everyone's going to forget what he said this year. And that's the process of doing this. That's, that's a Harry. Renna Rifkin used to do the same thing. Renna was a client of mine. The quality of Australian mortgage market is very important in terms of assessing house prices, because it, it, if the mortgage market is no good and it's leaking, like the sort of thing that happened in the US and other parts of the world, then that creates excess supply because people can't afford their homes. And as a result of creating excess, excess supply, we know, as I said right at the beginning, where the supply curve meets the demand curve, prices will come down because that's, that's the, that determines price. So if the demand stays the same but um, supply increases, then prices reduce. So what affects prices is affordability. I can't afford my home anymore. Well, this graph goes the opposite way to that. In Australia, of the mortgage holders in Australia, 30% of all mortgage holders in this country have 24 payments ahead of schedule. 24. And you can see pretty healthy in 12 to 24 and 6 to 12 as well. Pretty good. Australians, generally speaking, are ahead of schedule. That's why we have the best performing mortgage market in the world. So it's no surprise. That is a very important graph. RBA produces that. Not Harry Dent. Not The Economist. Not Demographia, who feeds the economist, who feeds Harry. Then Harry then writes a book and feeds himself. <laughs> Very happy to have a debate with Harry any time. Healthy mortgage market means healthy banking sector, which means we get money at the cheapest price in the world, which means the banks, in theory, can lend you the money at a competitive, reasonable rate that allows you to go and buy something and you're not going to get stymied. Because they too don't want to nail you because they want to keep their mortgage book good quality. Because they get assessed on their mortgage book by the regulator and the regulator makes them hold capital against their book. The better the quality of their book, in other words, the less stress they have in their book, the less capital they have to hold as a bank and the less capital they have to hold gives them a greater return on equity. The ROE is the thing that drives banks' decision making. And the bigger the ROE, the better the bank, the, the more the banks, the bigger the appetite the banks will have to lending more money. So there's this fine balance in banks and people like me between keeping my interest rate at a price that gives me the maximum margin, but also get, allowing me to have it at a low enough rate to maximise my flow in and to keep the quality of my book without stress. And we know that we have stress numbers we have to maintain, and those stress numbers are very, very important to us. And that's about keeping the interest rates, or the margin, I should say. We can't determine the interest rates, the Reserve Bank does that, but the margin for risk, that 300 base points I'm talking about. Keeping that at 300 is probably as much as they're ever going to get. It's never going to go beyond that. When I ran RISD, it was 120 basis points. 120 base points above the cash rate. So that's a very important graph for Australians to understand 
how good quality this, this place is. Now, that's across the nation. You might have worse in the Gold Coast and better in Brisbane or vice versa. Worse in Tasmania than it is in West Australia. Worse in Tasmania than it is in Sydney. That's a national number. Okay. The ninth most important thing is you must read the monetary policy from the Reserve Bank. This is the latest one in March. That's it. I mean, anybody who, in this room who can't read eight or nine paragraphs at 2.30 or any time on a Tuesday, the first Tuesday of any month, you shouldn't be in the room. It's pretty simple. Now you understand the eight points I've, I've said. The most important paragraph is the last paragraph. In the board's judgment, monetary policy is appropriately configured because it is a configuration of all the things I went through with you. It's a configuration. It's a mathematical algorithm. It's absolutely mathematically configured. It's not about emotions or sentiment or any of that sort of stuff. It's a configuration. It's appropriately configured. Two, foster sustainable growth, prosperity. 3.5% is what they want, growth. The thing they're talking about here is GDP. Foster sustainable growth. Well, the thing they measure their growth is, is GDP. For growth in demand and inflation outcomes consistent with the target, 2 to 3%. It's where we want it. On present indications, in other words, they're buying themselves and out, on present indications, the most prudent course is likely to be a period of stability in interest rates. The period the Reserve Bank talks about is medium term. They never talk about short term, they never talk about long term, they talk about medium term. Medium term is 12 to 18 months. So basically what they're saying is we don't think interest rates are going to change over the next 12 to 18 months. Now what we'll hear about is where the Bill Evans reckons is another interest rate reduction. Now Bill Evans is a smart guy. Westpac, he called it for Westpac, the rate reductions in two years ago when we, no one else is calling it. I give it to him. He, he's smart. Someone else might be calling, Shane Oliver might be saying, no interest rate reductions. All we tend to read about in the newspapers, this is going to be a rate reduction, it's not going to be a rate reduction. It's irrelevant. One rate reduction or one rate rise or no rate reduction fits straight into that last paragraph. What the Reserve Bank's saying to you is this, we're not going to start pushing interest rates up. Interest rates going up are always done in a cycle. So there's a cycle of interest rate rises, and they're generally speaking is six up or six down, seven up, seven down. We've had nine down because we need to have nine down because coming out of the GFC and the mining stuff tailing off, we've had quite a number of rate reductions. But we're back into normal cycles now. So if there's a rate increase, it will be part of a cycle of rate increases. And it won't come until after the medium term expires. The Reserve Bank's not just going to put one interest rate up and say, oh, let's wait and see what happens. They don't do that. They do not do that. And they're, not going to, they're unlikely to put one rate reduction because I think the cycle's finished. I think they just leave it where it is. Now, they may, now, that's assuming that nothing crazy happens, like, you know, the world falls apart. And if Harry's right and the world's going to fall apart, well, interest rates definitely aren't going to go up. And therefore, house prices maybe should stay the same unless people start losing their jobs. So this is an important paragraph. Likely to be a period of stability in interest rates, which means people can make decisions because we've got nice, stable environment, which is what we need for decision-making. People get nervous with rates going up and down and being volatile. That's why people aren't investing in the equity markets or haven't been investing in the equity markets until early this year, this calendar year, because of volatility. It gives you brain damage if you're looking at the, you know, you go and buy some shares and nab or something, they, you know, buy them for 50 bucks and they're worth 35 the next day. I mean, then they go back at a 50. I mean, you, it's brain damage stuff, you know? None of us want that. Especially on the Gold Coast, we're probably here to chill out, you know? <laughs> we don't need that shit. Um, so, also, equally, investors don't, in property don't want that same volatility. They don't want their brain damage. They're looking for stability. And stability comes with, starts with interest rate stable periods. So, to me, this is pretty, pretty good news. I'm not here to spruik the property market. Don't get me wrong, I'm not. But I am here to say that the property market is pretty safe. And I am here to say that well, I think we're in for a period of sustainable growth. The Reserve Bank has talked about the spikes in property prices in various segments and sectors. And they are well aware of it. But they have also said they're not concerned about it. Now, normally the Reserve Bank never looks at asset classes as a rule, like separate asset classes as a rule, because they're not allowed to. They're not allowed to look at equity markets or property markets. But clearly they do in the back room when they're talking, but they must. So significantly they've chosen to mention property price increases because the kids are getting commentated upon by the Fin Review and other people. One of the guys who writes the Fin Review has actually worked for me. Chris Joy. Anyone read Chris Joy's columns? People don't read the Fin Review here. Don't blame you. But Chris, Chris runs my Smarter Money Fund, my, fund, my managed fund. We, we have an enhanced cash fund. 
And Chris run, and he keeps writing about the spike in property prices and etc. He's not saying it's going to fall. He's just talking about the the um, econometrics around it, <clears throat> or the metrics around the economy. And um, and I've asked him to stop it, but of course he's a journalist, he won't listen to me, even though he's my CEO and I pay his wages, but it doesn't matter. He keeps writing about the bloody stuff and it aggravates the shit out of me, but what can you do? Um, I, I, but that sort of stuff, that sort of um, sentiment, caused the Reserve Bank to get nervous. So what the Reserve Bank has been doing is commenting upon it. And the commentary so far is, is look, it's okay. Because there's, if you go back to the GDP number, because that's all they're interested in, growth. What the hell is going to grow in this country? A property construction driven growth in this country and the growth in wealth that we feel as a result of our investments getting higher is very important for people in the household consumption component to start to spend more money. To get that number up to 3.5%, the Reserve Bank knows that. And without growth in property prices, you won't get developers coming in and adding more supply to the system because ultimately what's driving these property price increases is there's not enough supply and more demand, and it's pushing prices up. With more supply, it'll keep prices flat or in more sustainable growth patterns. But to get supply, you've got to convince developers to supply more. And developer's not going to supply more if he's buying it for a million and he's only going to sell it for a million. He's got to buy it for a million and be able to sell it for 1.2 or 1.3, depending on what he adds to it, does to it. And he's only going to do that if there's growth in the prices in the market and some, a little bit of exuberance, and the Reserve Bank knows that. And if this guy, developer, buys the problem, he's going to try and improve it. He's going to buy gyprock, rock, he's going to buy sand, cement, blah, 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 which is going to add to the household consumption number. And it's going to increase wages and it's going to keep employment where the Reserve Bank wants it for all the welfare of all Australians. So anyone in this room is invested in property and is being positive about it is actually helping the Reserve Bank do something. And that is look after the welfare of all Australians. Because without your input and without your positive mood around property and without you actually doing something about it, executing it, there, aren't, there, aren't, there is no business for people to start spending money on these sorts of inputs like sand and cement and labour, etc., which means unemployment drops back, which means consumption drops back and expenditure drops back, which means people start losing jobs. So it's very important for people like Harry to shut the fuck up. <laughs> Pardon my French. Because this country deserves a positive sentiment. And with positive sentiment, everything will go well. So it's all very well for newspapers to do what they do, and I do it myself sometimes. I try not to, but the editors are always urging me to do it, so I give you that context. It's very important for people like you to get out there and make positive contributions to the people you talk to and to spread the good news, the good word. But you need to have some, a series of steps, and what I tried to do here today was actually go through a series of steps for you just so you can logically build on everything, from everything you read, build on the logic of how it is to be configured, how you configure, your, configure rather your presentation, how you explain to somebody what it is that they need to hear about. Someone who's less able than you, less informed than you, less experienced than you, but actually wants to have and is enthusiastic about it, have the same experience as you, like do well in property. Property still is a very important asset class. You know, I should stipulate, it should form part of a total portfolio, but when something's a good, in a good environment, a rising tide, things are going well, you should actually probably invest more and more in the rising tide. Clearly you've got to know when to hold and when to get out. They're, they're, they're different issues. That's a different discussion. But in terms of the property market in general and the economic outlook as it, as it affects property markets and, and interest rates, as it affects GDP, and how the Reserve Bank interacts with all those things and configures mathematically an algorithm to give them an outcome which determines interest rates, and how this statement gets derived every month is what I wanted to talk to you about today. Thanks very much.